The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 6307 in the name of Roderick Campbell on sales of interest rate swap agreements. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in this debate could press their request to speak buttons now and ensure that their cards are correctly inserted. I call on Roderick Campbell to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, may I welcome members of the NAB Customer Support Group who are in the gallery for the debate, and I thank those MSP colleagues who stayed behind for the debate today. And may I also acknowledge the contribution of Simon Bain of the Herald on this issue. Following on from the PPI scandal and the manipulation of LIBOR rates, perhaps we should not be surprised that the banks are again also in the midst of another scandal, interest rate swaps mis-selling. The banks certainly have a long way to go to restore their battered image, an image which has again been tarnished this week by the latest scandal highlighted by the Times. This issue was first brought to my attention by a constituent back in 2011, and I've had a considerable amount of correspondence with the Clydesdale Bank on this issue. It's clear that the product my constituent was sold is not a straightforward financial product. In the past, many people placed a lot of trust in their long-term relationship with the banks, but the days of the friendly bank manager have long since gone. Sadly, banks today seem to many to be finance shops with substantial sales forces operating on commission to the neglect of the customer's real interest. Bully banks have been at the forefront of this campaign to highlight the issue and have illustrated just how it has affected small and medium-sized businesses across the United Kingdom. At Westminster, the all-party group has met often to discuss the issue, and I'm grateful for the assistance of the Lib Dem MP for Keridigian, Mark Williams, and his caseworker, Lisa Francis, as well as the Labour MP, Clive Betts. Some members may be asking, what exactly are interest rate swaps? Well, at the basic level, banks would offer customers the right to fix the base rate on a loan at a certain level to ensure that a rise in interest rates would not lead to a company's borrowing costs rising to a level they would be unable to pay. Customers were routinely advised that it was like a form of insurance or fixed rate mortgage. But interest rate swap agreements are highly complicated financial products that are difficult to get your head around if you don't have a degree in economics or finance. These loans were originally devised for sophisticated investors, but subsequently these products were then sold to small and medium-sized enterprises. Of course, while the rate swaps were designed to protect customers if interest rates rose, it also cost them dear when they fell. And as we all know, we've been living in a low interest environment for some while. A frequent allegation is that banks failed to properly advise on the break costs of exiting the swap when customers wish to terminate the agreement. It's clear that most customers were unaware of the complicated nature of the product when it was presented to them by their local banks. The mis-selling of interest rate swap agreements has had a devastating impact on the businesses affected, which includes bed and breakfasts, hotels and restaurants, amongst many others. Bully Bank surveys have subsequently identified these businesses as being the key target for the sale of tailored business loans, to which I will refer later. In April 2012, it emerged that the Financial Standards Authority had been told a year before about swap mis-selling by an industry whistleblower, but they ignored these warnings and the practices used in relation to what it now accepts were unsophisticated clients. This term lies at the heart of the matter. A review by the FSA was, however, agreed with a number of banks in June and July 2012 in relation to these unsophisticated clients. Its successor, the Financial Conduct Authority, have yet to confirm the date they will publish their findings, but I understand they're aiming to do so within the next six to eight weeks. But in an interim comment in January this year, however, the FSA accused Britain's largest banks of selling absurdly complex products and found that 90% of firms in a pilot study with the big four banks were missold complex interest swap rate agreements. Current best estimates are that the cost of compensation to be paid by banks may be up to £2 billion in the UK as a whole. The FSA have identified four broad categories of interest rate products sold. Swaps, which enable customers to fix their interest rates. Caps, which place a limit on any interest rate rises. 
collars which enable customers to limit interest rate fluctuations to within a simple range, and structured collars which enable customers to limit interest rate fluctuations to within a specified range, but involves arrangements where if the reference interest rate falls below the bottom of the range, the interest rate payable by the customer may increase above the bottom of the range. I said it was complicated, but FSA emphasised that an interest rate swap is a separate contract to the underlying loan agreement. It's an agreement between two parties whereby one type of interest payment is swapped for another, such as exchanging a fixed interest rate payment for a floating payment. As I understand it, since 2001, approximately 38,000 interest rate uh, hedging products have been sold in the UK. Approximately 2,000 structured collars, 28,000 swaps and simple collars, and 8,000 caps, with approximately 32,000 customers affected. In addition, although this was not part of the agreement with the FSA, uh, in October 2012, the Clydesdale Bank agreed that it would review the sale of some tailored business loans where the characteristics were comparable to standalone structured collars, simple collars, and caps but products which were excluded by them were products which included a fixed rate loan for any part of the loan period and which were deemed to be commercial loans or agreements. The FSA and now the FCA's position is that standalone IRHPSs are regulated by the FCA pursuant to European legislation, but commercial loans in their own right, including those with embedded interest rate hedging products, are not generally regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Despite requests to change that position, these still do not form part of the review. The FCA advised the all-party group at Westminster in May that they are in discussions about products which have similar features to complex IRHPS, but which are embedded within commercial loan agreements. But no, no final decision has been taken by the FCA, and their position remains at present that is a matter for the Treasury. The truth is, however, that a customer who's taken out a tailored business loan with an embedded IRSA may be faced with exactly the same repayment features and exactly the same potentially large break costs that the customer would have faced had they taken out a loan and a standalone IRHP. So why should tailored business loans be excluded on the grounds of a mere technicality? These loans with embedded or hidden swaps are just as toxic as standalone IRSAs. And if the bankers who sell the swap need to be registered with the FCA to do so, why is a swap not included in the review? They ought to be included in the review. This decision to exclude them means that fewer than 10% of all tailored business loans, those generally with a structured collar, with which the Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank have sold, are included within the review. So 90% are not. Derivatives experts such as Abhishek Sashdev believe that these tailored business loans should be included in the review. I agree. I believe that we need to put pressure on the Westminster government to assure that Taylor business loans in particular are so addressed. I'm aware that banking and the regulation of financial services is a reserve matter. Nevertheless, I hope that the Scottish government can demonstrate its support for those affected by the current exclusion of Taylor business loans in particular, by making the appropriate representations to the UK government, and by also encouraging the UK government to ensure that compensation for those affected by missold interest rate swaps generally are made. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. Turn to the open part of the debate. Speeches of four minutes. Please, Gavin Brown, to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by uh, congratulating uh, Roderick Campbell on securing members' business today and on bringing to the Chamber, uh, I think on behalf particularly of his uh, constituent, or some of his constituents, a very important um, a deeply, I think, distressing uh, subject for consideration. It is a very complex subject, and I have to say, I think his uh, speech dealt with it in a fair and fairly uh, straightforward manner. Uh, clearly, the uh, concerns about interest rate swap agreements have been around uh, for a year or two. The, additional, addition, the original anecdotal issues were about the products being inappropriate, the lack of explanation of risks, and particularly the pressure to buy that was put on at various businesses. Sometimes it was made a firm condition of the loan actually being given that they took out this product. And also, I think in a number of cases, there was anecdotal suggestion that a very short timescale was given to the business involved um, to actually make their decision, which made it even more difficult, I think, for them to get their head around it and also to take independent 
advice. Uh, Roderick Campbell said in his speech that it's difficult to get your head around the issue if you don't have a degree in economics or finance. Uh, that is definitely true, but I have to say I know plenty of people who have degrees in both who say it's equally difficult to get your head around the issues. Um, when the then FSA looked at this um, and published their initial findings in June of last year, um, they basically backed up almost entirely um, what businesses had been telling MPs, MSPs um, and the FSA. They talked about there being a very poor disclosure of the exit costs from the products, a failure in many cases to ascertain the customer's understanding of risk, um, non-advised sales straying into advice, over-hedging, uh, rewards and incentives being a driver of these practices, and to cap it all off, evidence of poor record keeping. And I think one of the biggest concerns uh, were the fact that there was no mention at all or minimal mention of the break costs of, from leaving that particular contract, and also the fact that in many cases, the length of the hedge contract was substantially longer than the length of the loan period. Therefore, when the loan came to the end, an end, perhaps after five years, they may have signed up to a 10-year contract and have to continue to pay for a hedging product over a loan that no longer existed because after the crisis hit, many of the loans simply were not uh, renewed by banks. I think the initial pilot review, to, which took place in January of this year, uh, would have been concern, of concern to many. Um, 173 sales were looked at uh, in greater detail. And the result was that over 90% of those did not comply with at least one regulatory requirement. That is a staggering figure. Now, I think it is fair to say that all of those were complex cases, so that not, might not be representative of the tens of thousands of cases as a whole. But that notwithstanding, the fact that it's so high in the, in the pilot, I think, should be of concern to all of us. Um, Deputy Presenting Officer, I think what is most important, though, is where we go from here. And I think it's absolutely critical um, that the timescale is as swift as possible, but at the same time taking time uh, to get it right. I think the banks involved who are looking at the customers who took out uh, these products have to prioritise the most vulnerable companies, and many of whom will be in great difficulty at the moment. They have to be processed quickest so that they don't stray into administration in the interim period. And I think on top of that, the attitude of the banks in going further than they have to go legally in resolving this is critical. Roderick Campbell talked about reputational issues and he was quite right to do so. The banks in this case can't just do the bare minimum to get through it. I think it has to be a case that they do everything they possibly can for their customers so that the, the independent reviewers aren't consistently sending them back because the ultimate sting in the tail, and I'll close on this point, the ultimate sting in the tail is the fact that most of these problems have arisen because of the um, extremely low, record low interest rates that we currently have. But the reason for those extremely low interest rates lies in quite some measure on the behaviour of the banks. They are behind, not exclusively, but they are behind in a large degree the fact that we have record low interest rates and that's why there's an, a doubly important reason for them to resolve these issues as quickly and as effectively as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Chick Brody. <clears throat> this chamber, uh, presiding officer, has been the centre of many emotions, but none so great as the anger. The anger felt on this issue by myself, by my colleagues, and certainly by those affected, some of whom are with us today. Today we highlight the dangers of embedded interest swaps of tailored business loans, the shark, the shark that lies just below the surface of bank lending to small and medium businesses. Presiding officer, much as it went beyond my entrepreneurial spirit, I suggested after 2008 that we should have taken those banks that were supported by public funds at least temporarily into public ownership to ensure there was a change to the casino culture of the banks and in particular the investment part of some banks. We didn't and they haven't. Uh, privilege here doesn't extend to this chamber. We can't <coughs> name or shame, uh, but the banks concerned uh, know who they are. And the Financial Secretary to the Treasury at Westminster has confirmed uh, to the other parliament that Yorkshire and Clydesdale Bank 
had agreed to review at least one customer's fixed rate loan. Presiding officer, the interest rate swap mechanism embedded in Taylor Business Loans is a relatively simple finance mechanism. If one considers two parties who have taken out loans of equal value, one at a prevailing fixed rate and the other at a floating rate, the parties then swap the loans, but then as the loan principle is the same, only the interest rates effectively are swapped. The problem being that one party, in this case the bank, demands a risk premium for its gambling from the other party, in this case our small business clients. And that, presiding officer, is a premium on the floating interest rate which was tied to the LIBOR, to the London Interbank offered rate. The rate at which you will recall, presiding officer, was the subject of daily manipulation by bank representation on the LIBOR committee. Here we had bankers, or at least some of them, gambling with other people's chips. That interest rate gambling, embedded as they are in the Taylor business loans, are not fixed rate loans, but as some of our friends here today will tell you, the banks say they are. They will smooch, even that they are better and more protected than fixed rate loans. They are not. And the conditions inherent in these uh, tailored business loans, particularly if you wish to exit, to break the loan, are penal. Banks will stay surreptitiously quiet and or will write into the small print conditions around these loans. They will not make it clear that their investment risk is to be passed on to the client and they wouldn't want you to know that to exit the loan may ultimately cost you 20, 30 or even 40 per cent of the loan value. Presiding officer, I could regale the chamber with story, story so far of, for example, Mr and Mrs L, who having paid off most of their initial loan now owe more because of the exit break fees. Or Mr and Mrs H, they were told that they would have to pay 30% of a large loan when they plan to pay off a loan early. Or Mr P, a tea shop owner. Or Mr M, who had been himself involved in banking. Or Mr B, a small successful businessman in Dundee. Or Mr Mac, or of a church, a church that now cannot provide its community services for which it was renowned because of expensive missold loans. Presiding officer, the UK government and regulators I believe, are exploring the expansion of the compensation scheme for missold swaps uh, to fixed loans. But maybe too late. The horse may have bolted. We believe there are, throughout the UK, 40,000 embedded interest rate swaps. And if we add fixed rate loans, which are subject to scrutiny, another 60,000, all affecting small businesses, good, good small businesses. Uh, £2 billion, pounds, as Rod Campbell said, have been set aside to address that. But that, I would say, presiding officer, is, presiding officer, is not enough to assuage the loss of property, the loss of lifestyle, the creation of worry, the uh, unnecessary anxiety that has been imposed upon, as I say, some of these small good business people. It will certainly not be enough to assuage the anger, and I ask the, the Parliament to act and encourage Westminster to move quickly in support of these small businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call the Cabinet Secretary to respond to the debate, could I just clarify the issue of parliamentary privilege for the record? Section 41 of the Scotland Act provides that for the purposes of the law of defamation, any statement made in proceedings of the Parliament and the publication under the authority of the Parliament of any statement is absolutely privileged. This is to ensure that members are free to debate and the Parliament to report on matters of public interest without fear of an action for defamation being raised. Um, I now call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary. Could you please respond to the debate in around seven minutes? Uh, Presiding Officer, can I begin in uh, recording my thanks to Roderick Campbell for raising the motion on a very important subject. Um, uh, Mr Campbell, uh, I think, demonstrated in the presentation of this argument that he put to Parliament the depth of analysis that he has undertaken in addressing issues that have come to him on behalf of his constituents. I think that is exactly what Members of Parliament should be doing in uh, facing real-life circumstances that are affecting the, the members of the public that we have the privilege to represent. 
and to bringing those issues here to Parliament to ensure there is full scrutiny and attention to the significance of the issues that have been raised. And um, I thank Mr Campbell for um, setting out so clearly and in such depth um, the significance of the issues that, with which we are wrestling today. Um, and the, the issues are significant because I think a number of members in their contributions today and um, I have my own uh, experience in my own constituency caseload of the implications of interest, rates, interest rate swap agreements on members of the public in the small business community, that they raise, raise very important and significant implications for members of the public who have taken on these agreements. And um, I think we are all aware when we see these circumstances of the depth of difficulty that they cause for members of the public. At the heart of the debate, um, and I think this really gets to the nub of the argument that was put forward by Mr Campbell, is a question of trust and about whether or not individuals who are seeking to develop and grow their businesses, and that is precisely what we all want them to do. We want to encourage business growth, and this Parliament has expressed its opinion on countless occasions about the extent to which business growth must emerge from the SME community. It is essential that SMEs are able to access the financial support and assistance to enable them to grow their business. So the people who have been affected by interest rate swap agreements are not doing something that's unusual or doing something that is at the high end of risk. They are simply trying to grow their local businesses in their local communities in the fashion that Parliament and politicians are encouraging them to do so. And they are going to financial institutions in an atmosphere that they should be able to go to, an atmosphere of trust, to obtain the necessary products and support and access to finance to enable that to happen. Because um, I venture to suggest to Parliament, I'm not sure how business growth happens without participating banks, supporting expansion of the SME community and engaging in the uh, delivery of these products. The problem, however, is that people have been sold products that are not appropriate for their requirements. And Mr Campbell made the point about the judgment and the definition of these products being sophisticated products for an unsophisticated market. And if there is ever a statement that rather marshals the difficulty that we're wrestling with here, it is perhaps that issue. So at the heart of this, members of the public should be sold products and advised on products that are appropriate for their needs and their circumstances. We, that has clearly not been the case here, and we are now in a situation of uh, some difficulty for the individuals that are involved. And the first port of call to try to resolve those issues must be the actions for remediation that the banks can take themselves. In all of the dispute resolution procedures that this Parliament ever presides over, we have a common theme, which is to say disputes are best resolved at the closest point to decision making, rather than for them to be investigated and pursued over a longer period. So I encourage the banking sector to engage with those who are affected and to come to fo some form of resolution on these questions as quickly and as effectively as possible. Because without that, we then get into the territory that Mr Brown fairly raised in the debate, which is the longer the inquiry and the more protracted the inquiry there is into these uh, particular arrangements, the more difficult the financial situation can be for the individual who has taken out these, this product in the first place. So early resolution by these mechanisms is important. Um, in addressing the, uh, the substance of the issues, uh, as Mr Campbell has said, and uh, uh, both Mr Brodie and Mr Brown have mentioned, the Financial Conduct Authority has now secured agreement to take forward inquiries into these matters. And again, I would encourage speedy resolution of that inquiry um, to ensure that the issues are properly addressed. Mr Campbell made a, a, a strong point about the need for that review to take into account the issue of tailored business loans. And I uh, will commit today 
um, to contacting the Financial Conduct Authority to press the point that Mr Campbell has raised about expanding the remit of the review uh, to take into account the issue of tailored business loans um, that uh, has been raised in the debate today. We must also ensure that the review and the banks themselves are engaged in a dialogue with those who are affected to try to resolve these issues um, again in a, a speedy timescale. There has been some dialogue with um, the Bully Banks organisation between the FCA and also uh, with the banks. I would encourage that uh, position to uh, continue because at the heart of resolving this issue will be uh, that process of review and inquiry and dialogue with the individual banks on the individual cases involved. But in general, the resolution of this issue is by ensuring that we have the highest standards of banking advice and decision making and uh, support that's uh, available for members of the public. And in that respect, our banks have been in a difficult and poor position. Uh, there are many thousands of people work day and daily in our banks delivering good service and good support to members of the public. In some circumstances, we have seen and we have experienced and some members of the public have experienced in a very acute fashion the uh, absence of that quality of service and appropriateness of advice that those individuals have experienced. It is in nobody's interest for that to be prolonged. It's in everyone's interest, including the banks, for that to be resolved and remedied as quickly as is possible. I thank Mr Campbell for raising this issue, an important issue that affects members of the public who have been badly affected by the decision-making around these products. And I assure him of the Government's encouragement to the re review process to try to resolve these issues as quickly as we possibly can do. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes Roger Campbell's business, uh, Members' Business on Sales of Interest Rate Swap Agreements. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm. <laughs>